We are at the brand new Detroit Lakes Police Station with Chief Todd and he's here to give us a, a tour of the inside and the outside to be quite honest and this is a, a pretty exciting moment that we finally got this new police station built. A lot of technology built into the police station. We're going to go take a look at it but let's actually start Chief Todd with the parking lot because the new building really starts here in the parking lot. It does. So out here in the parking lot, we're going to have a safe exchange zone set up for our residents. And that would be something they could use if they were buying a, a product from an online sale or uh, exchanging custody of kids if maybe there's some difficulty in the relationship. So out here in the parking lot off of the northeast corner of the building, there's two parking spots that are painted yellow instead of white like the rest of the lot. And I'll have signs installed shortly, um, but that'll be a safe exchange zone for people to use and it'll be under video, video surveillance 24 hours a day. It is a sunny 92 degrees in Detroit Lakes today. I'm feeling great out here, but I have a feeling with all the gear you're wearing, yep. the air conditioning might be a I'm, little nicer. I'm getting warm and yeah, let's go inside let's go and show people around. So we're here in the vestibule of the main lobby entrance and we have some features in this vestibule that the public would, would be interested in. They're not fully programmed yet, so all the IT features aren't fully up and running, but you can see the concepts. And eventually, at nighttime or in the after business hours, we'll keep the outside doors unlocked and the inside vestibule doors will be locked. Uh, we have a neat feature of a panic button mounted on the wall, which is that yellow button. And if a resident or, or visitor to our community felt like they were in danger, they could come into this vestibule and activate that panic button, which would lock the outer doors and keep that person who was concerned in a protected environment. At the same time that they push that button and lock those doors, a, a surveillance camera will activate above them and we would be notified that there was a panic alarm in this vestibule. Um, another feature that we have is there's an intercom phone that's mounted right above the panic button and that intercom phone will be a, a single push button where they can push it and they'll get either the front desk if the office is open or they'll go to dispatch if our office is closed. So here we are in the main lobby of the police station and some of the most notable features are the eight uh, antique or historical photographs that line the upper wall in the lobby. And all of these photographs were obtained from different sources. Some were obtained from the Becker County Museum, some were obtained from family members of the officers that are in the image, and some we had in our own historical files here at the PD. But I believe they just add a really nice touch and pay tribute to the uh, officers that came before us and honor them for the work that they did in our community, as well as tie the police department to the community that we're serving. So tell me a little bit about this photo. Are these guys wearing wool? Coats. Yeah, it appears so. That photograph was taken in 1915 and that is all the law enforcement that was in the Becker County area at that time. Uh, the gentleman standing in the back was the Becker County Sheriff. The gentleman seated on the left that appears very tall was the DL Police Chief in 1915. His name was Burt Clements and he was six foot six and weighed 250 pounds. And the gentleman seated on the right was the night patrol officer. Um, I don't remember exactly what their, the names were of the sheriff and the night patrol officer, but they're very Scandinavian names. And uh, that was it back in 1915. Uh, Bert Clements was described as the most colorful police chief uh, in Detroit Lakes, and I joke that they hadn't met Tim Agabrotten yet, because <laughs> he's very colorful too. So Tim and I were joking about that oh. yesterday. So some other features here in the lobby. Um, is that we now have security for our record staff and if you'd ever been to our old police department it was wide open and they had absolutely zero security. Now our record staff are safe and they're in a safe protected work environment that we're able to provide. Now we're standing in what we call the community room and this is a large uh, meeting room or training room that can seat up to 30 people. And our vision for this room is that the space could be used by community service groups in Detroit Lakes that were needing meeting space. Um, things that come to the top of my head would be Kiwanas and Rotary, uh, maybe Cub Scouts or Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts or a Bible study, a Dave Ramsey class, those types of things that if people were needing to have a space to meet, we would try to help facilitate them in here. Uh, the room has uh, very modern uh, audio vid video equipment, so there's monitors and projectors as well as speakers mounted into the ceiling in here. Um, this room has protective ballistic glass on the north and the west wall, so uh, the occupants of the room are protected in here. And really the showcase in this room t uh, is this large photograph of, of two men who were police officers 
in Detroit Lakes. This particular photograph was taken in about 1965 and it was taken uh, on Washington Avenue just uh, about five doors north of Bugzay's Hardware. Um, they tore down that whole block in 1966 to make room for Highway 10, but at that time the police station was on Washington and the nearest that I can place it is about where the flagpoles for Veterans Memorial Park stand now. And the two gentlemen in this picture are, are both really unique men. Um, the man on the left is named Walt Tullifson and the man on the right was named Al Tig. Both of them have passed away, but both of them went on to become the Chief of Police in Detroit Lakes later in their careers. And in fact, Walt Tullifson went on to become a City Council member and an ordained Episcopalian priest. Um, so I had the privilege of showing this photograph to um, Mr. Tullifson's widow, Doreen Tullifson, and it was a, a complete honor to show it to her. And then uh, the following week, I was able to show it to uh, his rest of his family, some brothers and sisters and uh, some children. So it's a great photograph, um, really captures these two guys and the, the environment in Detroit Lakes back in the 60s, and we're happy to honor both of them. So here we are in the, in the backbone or the heart of the police department, and we built this uh, police department with a large open area that shares that open space between records which is on this side and patrol which is on this side. So some of the features that you'll see in here is that all of the walls are lined with tile. It's a tile wainscoting and the reason that we installed that is because uh, every police department or sheriff's office I've worked in the officers always bump into the walls with their gun belts and what happens is, is over time they chew away the drywall and it turns it black and puts big gouges in in the high traffic areas. So we sought to protect those walls and by installing a tile product the gun belts won't damage them at all. Um, you can see on this side over here we have some extra cubicles to help records grow in the future and we won't have to add any space or purchase any furniture. So we can essentially double our record staff as needed without any changes in infrastructure. Um, behind me here is the patrol division and now we have eight workstations for our patrol officers uh, that they can work out of. Uh, we, we currently only have four computers set up in here but keep in mind in our old police station we only had two computers for all of our patrol staff to use. So this gives us uh, ability to grow by a growth factor of four going from two to eight which uh, translates to we'll be able to staff a significantly higher number of police officers in the future as the city grows. So what are some of the things that uh, your officers are doing at these cubicles on a day-to-day -day basis? Uh, on a day-to-day -day basis they're typing all their reports on these computers. Um, they're entering evidence on either this computer or one downstairs in the evidence room that I'll show you. Um, and they do a lot of their internet research or connection with uh, state computer systems to determine driver's license and registration status. Um, they also complete their accident reports on these computers. Virtually all of their work products are done on computer now and we do very little on handwritten reports. So, um, If you look up in the uh, ceiling area you can see what we call a clear story. Uh, the clear story uh, seeks to make the space feel bigger by raising the ceiling and this one has windows installed on the north side of the clear story. And the reason we did that is if you had ever been in our old building during the summer, by about one o'clock in the afternoon it was 80 plus degrees in that station because all the windows face south. Uh, this allows the ambient light to come in from, from the daylight being shown outside, but it doesn't let the direct sunlight in to heat up the workspace. So it's a, it's a nice feature for the officers to have above them. This is an example of one of our investigations offices. This current office is, is unoccupied or unassigned at this time, but each of the offices in the building have the same furniture and a very similar layout and equipment set. Where we're at now is what we call the roll call room, and the purpose that this room will serve is largely in the future. Uh, every day as the department grows and they have more officers checking on at one time, they'll need to receive a shift briefing by their shift sergeant. And they'll learn things like um, what beat they're assigned to that day, what squad car they're driving, if they're going to be doubled up with a partner at any point during their shift, who that will be. Um, and then also some other things like what are the fresh stolen cars of the day or what's a, a problem that we're going to work on solving today. And then we always joke that it's also where they learn what the chief's mad about this week. <laughs> so in the future that's what they'll have in this room is those daily roll calls at the beginning of each shift which will happen two to three times a day depending on what shift structure we're working. 
Another purpose for this room is for internal training. If we were going to hold a course just for Detroit Lakes officers or for Detroit Lakes officers and Becker County deputies, people that have regular access to this building, we'd hold the course in here. Um, conversely, if we were going to host a class for outside agencies, we would hold that class in the community room where it's easily accessible off the lobby and uh, an officer that's visiting for the first time doesn't have to search hard to find his way to where the course is being held. Um, one other thing that I'll tell you about this space and the community room is that they're both set up with power and data in each of those um, panels on the floor. So the room can be used as an emergency operations center. For example, if we had a large tornado roll through Detroit Lakes and there was still bad weather in the area and we needed to get all those different departments in the same place to communicate to best serve our community, we could set up an emergency operations center in here. And in that scenario where we have active bad weather still remaining in the area, I would use this room for it because it's an interior room. Whereas sure. the community room is, uh, is, has two exterior walls, that probably wouldn't be the best choice for um, continued bad weather. Well, as we've been walking around the police station, it, it seems like you've prepared for future growth, not, not only of the police force, but also the city. What are your expectations as the, the city grows in the next 5, 10, 15, even 50 years from now? Well, that's the, the whole purpose of how we designed this, is that they shouldn't have to put another footing in the ground for decades. And this building is set up so we can grow uh, additional officers. It's impossible to, impossible to predict how fast we'll need to grow, but I really look at how much are we asking each officer to do during each work day, and if that looks to be excessive, that's when I look to add staff. So what we're looking at now is one of our three interview rooms in the building, and we actually have two of them on the main level and one in the lower level. These rooms are very technologically advanced in that the officers can activate the audio video recording system just using their access card and they'll swipe their access card at a reader and now the camera and microphones in the room are recording. And these rooms will be used for a lot of different things and most commonly um, obtaining statements from victims or witnesses of crimes. So now we're inside of the men's locker room in the police station and this is actually a really nice feature for our staff. On the south wall of the locker room are three full bathrooms and each bathroom obviously has a toilet, a sink and a full shower as well as a changing bench. And then inside the main part of the locker room we have 26 lockers. And these lockers are actually pretty uniquely equipped so this is an example of one of them. Up on the top shelf of the locker each, uh, each officer has a locker with an outlet in it and that's important because they have portable radios, flashlights and cell phones that they need to charge. We have a small armory box in case they carry an off-duty weapon into work and need to secure that. And then one of the nicest features of these lockers is a really deep boot drawer so they have plenty of space to keep um, extra duty equipment. Really, uh, the thought process behind putting such a nice locker room in is that I really want to expand on the officer wellness in the police department. And one of those factors of officer wellness is physical fitness. And we built this building right across the street from the city-owned Detroit Lakes Community and Cultural Center. And I really feel we need to take advantage of that location and, and help utilize that and become partners with the DLCCC. My goal in the future is as we progress through contract negotiations with our police officers that we provide a membership for each officer to be exercising next door at the DLCCC. And I'm willing to step that up even further in that as the, as the head of the police department, if we were fully staffed on a shift, one of those officers at a time could go over and exercise during their shift for an hour of their workday. And the reason that I'm so committed to that idea is because the largest uh, expenses for workers' comp claims in law enforcement are back problems and heart problems. So if we can get officers involved in cardiovascular exercise, it's actually going to save our city and our workers' comp plans money. So those are some of the things that I'm hoping to do and, and build upon with this locker room. You know, my favorite place in any building, Chief Todd, is, is the place where the food's at, and I think we found it. So. Yes, yeah, we're in the kitchen and break room, and I agree with you, JT, this is a great room, and there is often food in here. But this room is a really nice area for our officers just to get away. It's in a quiet corner of the building. You don't hear a lot of the hustle bustle going on, and the color 
choices for the room just kind of make you feel like you're relaxed a little bit. But our officers and staff have a, a place here where they can make dinner or do a potluck on their shift and, uh, and they just have a nice place where they can sit down and eat and take a break. This is a decontamination laundry room and the reason that we need a place like this is sometimes our officers um, get biohazards on themselves or their uniforms and those are the type of materials we don't want our officers to have to bring home and clean in their families' washers and dryers. So we provided a washer and dryer to be used for those decontamination events where they need to get some type of biohazards off of their police uniforms. So where we're at now, JT, is in a, a hallway towards the garage of the police department. And what these are, are duty bag cubbies. So each officer carries a duty bag in their squad car. And those duty bags are pretty heavy. Uh, they usually set them on the passenger seat of the car. And now each officer has a place to keep that when they're not working. So what would be inside a duty bag? They'll keep different files and papers that they might need to help go about their shift and various different pieces of equipment that they utilize during their shift. So where we are now is in our gun cleaning room. And Officer Joe Steffens did a really good job of helping equip this room and getting it set up for firearms cleaning. Um, Cleaning firearms inside a police department is governed by some uh, state regulations as well as some OSHA regulations. Yeah, and it also causes problems because the solvents can damage walls and paint. So we have a nice stainless steel counter and backsplash that will help protect any, uh, from any damage from the gun cleaning solvents that we use. And then we also have ventilation in the room which will help vacate that air. This is an excellent spot to get our firearms well working and clean. This is our department armory. So everything related to the use of force is kept in this room. This is a card accessed room, so it's protected from anybody who is not a department member. And all of our items relating to use of force are stored in this room, including all of our firearms, ammunition, um, pepper ball, taser, and OC spray. We're in our evidence intake area now, so for examples of how this room is used is when officers are out on the street and they're developing a case, they're going to collect evidence and we need to properly preserve and store that evidence to ensure the chain of custody is solid for any potential court cases that may come. So the officers are going to bring their evidence down here and they'll actually package their evidence in a heat sealable baggie and they'll go on to our computer system and print out a barcode label and place that barcode label on the exterior of the plastic bag. The officer will also select one of these pass-through lockers on this wall. So he could place his evidence in this locker, which is locker number nine, and push the button and now that locker is locked. Uh, the evidence manager will take care of the evidence on the other side of the room. Another re really great feature of this room is that in a year and a half when that case finally goes to trial, the officer can ask the evidence room manager to pass back the evidence from his case. And the evidence room manager can assign a discrete combination to the officer so he can retrieve his evidence from one of these lockers and take it to court. Okay, so we are in the actual evidence room of the new police department now. This is where all the evidence is stored for all of our cases in Detroit Lakes. And in the room we were just at, the evidence intake room, I showed you where we would place evidence in a pass-through locker. And here is the evidence room side of those lockers. So I believe it was uh, this shelf that I showed you from the other side, shelf number nine, um, and we locked it by pushing the button so that locker is locked. The evidence room manager can unlock it just by pulling that lever and now that locker is reset and ready to be used by another officer for another case. We use a numerical storage system in here and we use that on banker's boxes. So every banker's box has a barcode with a number on it. And that number means where the box is in the room. So our zero point is up in this corner and this box is 1101, 1102, 1103, 1201, 1301, 1401, and so on. To give you a little scale with the difference in size that we have here compared to our old police department, we could store about 45 banker's boxes in our whole evidence room in the old police department. In this room, just on one shelf, we could store 60 boxes and we have five shelves, which means we can store a total of about 300 boxes in this evidence room. I'll show you just a random piece of evidence from one of the boxes in here without uh, getting in zoomed in on, nail, on any names or anything, but this is what a barcode label looks like that we print out and affix to the evidence. Some other notable features in this room are that we have a fume hood. 
That would be used if we were going to attempt to obtain fingerprints on a, a hard surface item using a superglue fuming method. The fuming superglue is toxic and we can't be breathing that, so it gets vacated from the building through the fume hood. We also have an evidence drying cabinet next to the refrigerator. That would be used if we needed to dry some blood-stained clothing that uh, maybe a victim of a crime was wearing during a, a shooting or a stabbing or an assault. So that cabinet can dry the blood from that clothing before packaging. The problem if you don't dry it is it will get completely um, molded and will rot the cloth. And then the final interesting thing that I'll show you in this room is we have actually a very high security um, storage room here that you have to display a card and punch in a pin number. And this room we'll use to store hard drugs and cash. And there's surveillance camera on the ceiling of that room to monitor any activity that occurs in there and records upon any motion. So it's dual authentication entry and it's continuous surveillance during any motion. So let's say you get evidence, you do what you need, you store it here, it goes to court, the case is closed, what then happens to the evidence that you Once collected? a year, the evidence room manager does a purge of the evidence in the room. And so he seeks input from the case officer who collected the evidence. The case officer must investigate and find out if the case has gone to trial, if the appeals peri period has extinguished, um, and if the evidence will not be needed for anything in the future, then that evidence will be destroyed. Sure. Okay. Including cash? No, cash will be deposited. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right now, JT, we're down in our Tuck Under Garage, and this is a great facility for our department. It actually holds 13 vehicles down here and has a number of other features that I'm excited to tell you about. Uh, the first one I'll start with is that'll be important for the six month winters that we have is that this whole garage has in-floor heat along with uh, air circulating heat as well. There's CO2 and NO2 detectors so if an officer were to let the car run for too long in here that detector system would uh, turn on an air exchange system and it would vacate all the contaminated air. Uh, we also have pretty elaborate security camera system you can see right above us there. There's a four-way camera on the ceiling that uh, covers all of the areas in this garage. Um, finally, we also have a really robust wireless access point system down here. Each of our squad cars has a watch guard dashboard camera system and when the officer drives into the garage, that camera system links with the wireless access point to transmit all of the video data into our servers. Wow. So they don't, they don't have to pull an SD card out and walk up to their cubicle and stick it in, it does it automatically? It does it automatically. It was a feature that we just changed about a year ago and it really improved the workflow and working conditions for our staff. Right now we're inside of our vehicle evidence processing bay. This is a really big improvement for our department. Uh, I'm going to give you an example of what this room would be used for and how important it is. Uh, say we had a sexual assault occur inside of a vehicle. Some of the necessary evidence that we're going to need to collect in a sexual assault investigation is biological evidence, and that can be very small and difficult to see. With this room, we'd have the ability to have a tow truck back that vehicle where the assault occurred inside of it into this room, and we could actually lock the vehicle in this room to protect it. Um, the garage door has a lock on it, and I can actually change whose card will open the walk-in door here. So if you were the investigating officer, I could lock this room down to everybody except you so we can maintain the chain of custody. Then you would write a search warrant on the vehicle, um, have a judge review it and decide if you had enough probable cause to search that vehicle. And if the judge signed it, you would gather your team to come down here and search the vehicle. We have waist high LED lighting all the way around the room, plus very extensive ceiling mounted lighting. And that is all gonna enable you and your investigating team to find that biological evidence that we're gonna need to obtain DNA, which will help secure a successful prosecution on the case. Some really neat features of the lighting in this room is that the lights mounted up on the ceiling all have a filter in them to prevent shadows from being cast directly down. So if you actually walk directly under one of these ceiling mounted lights and look up at it, you'll see that there's filtering going on where you cannot see yeah. the light directly. And that helps when you're trying to search an area, you aren't blocking your view with shadows just caused by your head and your hands. Yeah, it's funny, you don't, you don't realize there's really no shadows in mm -hmm. here. 
it really, it, it's very important to have that type of stuff to help give you the opportunity to find the evidence that you're looking for. Um, some other features in this room is that there's another wireless access point here that you connect to. You can connect to with your laptop computer while you're entering evidence. And then there's also a nice workstation that you can get your evidence organized for processing at the back of your home. Well, this has been a fantastic tour, and I uh, just want to thank you for showing us uh, the new police station. You've got a beautiful facility, but not only is it beautiful, but it's very functional and it's set up for future growth of, of the city and the police force. And uh, we thank you for your service and the work that you do here. Thank you. I'm glad you came. I appreciate the opportunity to share the, the viewing of this with our community members. And we really want to thank our community for supporting our police department not only on just this building project, which is amazing, but also the support they give our officers out in the community every day. I also want to thank our city leadership. That includes our city administrator and elected officials that really helped make this project become a reality. This makes a huge difference in the day-to-day -day workings of every person that works for the police department. And you are going to see a more professional work product because of the facility that you've provided to these officers. So the biggest message that I want to give to, to everybody who's watching this is thank you. We're, we're so grateful for this and it means so much to us and it changes so much for us that the department is going to be on an upward trajectory now and we greatly appreciate it. Cool. Thank you.